فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن نبينا وسيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic of today is the topic of المسيح الدجال And the Dajjal is something which there is a lot of fact about and there is also a lot of fiction about And because many people don't know about the reality of the Dajjal They haven't studied the Dajjal They don't know anything concerning the Dajjal Many people have a lot of false notions And because of this many people make many mistakes And sometimes grave mistakes with regards to the Dajjal And I will give you a simple example of this When I was um, studying in the Islamic University in Medina One year a group of us we went for Hajj And whilst we were in the Haram I can remember I think we were on the roof of the Haram And if you ever been to like the Masjid Al-Haram When you go to the roof One of the most beautiful things that you can do is look down And you see The Mataf The place where people are making Tawaf They're in their Haram and they're making Tawaf And it's one of the most beautiful sites in the world So we were looking down And we were making this Tawaf And then there was a skirmish down there So because we were so high, we couldn't really tell what was going on, but there was a skirmish. And so we could tell that the police officers came running in and there was some like shouting and screaming, and there was some problem down below. So we couldn't really tell what was going on. But after we finished from the Haram and as we were coming out, we saw some police officers. So we asked them, we said, you know, what was going on? What was the problem there? There seemed to be some difficulty. So they replied that basically there was a man who was making tawaf and all of a sudden he's in ihram he's making tawaf all of a sudden he sees someone else also making tawaf also in ihram and he goes and he begins to attack him now he had something sharp with him some kind of a weapon and he began to stab him and slice him and he just went and attacked him so when the people saw this they obviously started shouting and screaming and they pulled him away and as they were pulling him away one of the things that he said was that this man, leave me alone, this man is a Dajjal, let me kill him. And this is like, you know, in Hajj or Umrah, people are making tawaf, they're in ihram, by the Kaaba. And he's shouting this and he's trying to stab and kill this man. So this, from the outset, shows that when we don't know about the Dajjal, like anything else, when you're ignorant about something, then it will overpower you, it will overtake you. So it is necessary to learn about these aspects of our religion, So that we're better equipped to deal with these situations. Had this man studied about the Dajjal, had he learned about the Dajjal, had he studied his religion, he would have known the reality of the Dajjal. What the Dajjal can do, what the Dajjal can't do, where he can go, where he can't go, what will happen to him, what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned concerning him. And then he would have known For example, in that situation that there is no way that the Dajjal would be in ihram making tawaf. This is just something simple he would have learned. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, over and over again throughout his sunnah, he mentions the Dajjal over and over again to highlight his importance. And I will mention to you just a number of these sayings, a number of these ahadith. From them is a saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, collected in Sunan ibn Majah. ما بين خلق ما بين خلق آدم وقيام الساعة أمر أكبر من الدجال. There is not a single affair, not a single thing, from the time of the creation of Adam until the establishment of the hour, until يوم القيامة. There is not a single affair which is greater than the Dajjal. And Subhanallah, when we stop and pause and ponder over this hadith, reflect over it. How many generations have passed since the time of Adam? How many millennia, decades upon decades, centuries upon centuries, thousands upon thousands of years have passed. And the Prophet ﷺ knows the history 
of all of the prophets, the flood of Nuh, what took place between Ibrahim and his people, what took place between Musa and Fir'aun, all of the azab, all of the iqab, all of the punishments that Allah Azza wa Jal sent. Yet he still says, from the time of Adam until Yawmul Qiyamah, the single greatest affair will be the affair of the Dajjal. Now the Dajjal, as we know, will be one of the major signs of Yawmul Qiyamah. He will be one of the major signs that Yawmul Qiyamah is coming. But even so, even so that he is one of the major signs, not just of the Yawmul Qiyamah, but from the time of Adam until Yawmul Qiyamah, there is nothing greater than the affair of the Dajjal. And not another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Sahih Muslim. He said, Inna Allah ta'ala lam yada' nabiyyan illa haddhar ummatahu min al-dajjal. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send a single messenger. He did not send a single prophet except that he warned his people against the Dajjal. Now imagine this. From the time of Adam alayhi salam, again we're going right to the beginning of history. Going through each and every single prophet and messenger that subsequently came, each and every single one of them warns against the Dajjal. Subhanallah. They warn against the Dajjal. They don't warn against Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They don't warn against like many of the other signs that will come. They don't warn about the majority of things. But one thing they will warn each and every single nation about is the Dajjal. And this is in Sahih Muslim. Again, just showing the gravity of the situation. In another beautiful hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is said that he would teach his companions, Radiallahu Anhum, he would teach his companions a dua to seek refuge from the Dajjal, just as he would teach them a surah from the Quran. And in some narrations, just as he would teach them Surah Al Fatiha from the Quran. So just as he would teach his companions how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, how to pray, how to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, these like surahs of the Qur'an that are so important, he would also teach them this dua. And it is a dua that they would recite in each and every single prayer. Just as they recite Surah Fatiha in each and every single prayer, they would recite this dua in each and every single prayer at the tashahud. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnat al-mahya wal-mamat wa min fitnat al-masih al-dajjal Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of hellfire and from the punishment of the grave and from the trials of living and dying and from the trials of the dajjal Four things and the last of them is the trial of the dajjal Imagine learning this Dua just as you learn Surah Al-Fatiha. Now think back to our situation. Let's relate it to our present day situation. How many of us even know this dua ourselves? Let alone teaching it to our wives, our families, our children. No one knows this dua. Rarely do people come. People always come up to me when I mention this dua and they ask, where is this dua? Where did you get it from? Where can I learn it from? They don't know this dua. And it's found in the fortress of the Muslim, Hisn al-Muslim, this dua book that everyone knows of. It's found within this book. It's a very popular common dua. But many of us don't know it, we don't memorize it, let alone recite it in each and every single prayer. But the Prophet ﷺ is teaching his companions and his ummah the importance of the Dajjal, his significance when he comes, the trials that he will bring. So he is warning us against the Dajjal and telling us to seek protection and refuge in Allah from the Dajjal. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, and this is the hadith that scares me most. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that the Dajjal will not appear until people are neglectful and the Imams forget to mention the Dajjal upon the manabir. When the Imams and the scholars and the leaders of the community forget to mention the Dajjal on the minbar, in the Jum'ah khutbah, in their lectures, this is a sign in and of itself that the Dajjal's time is near. He is about to come. And subhanAllah, think back, how many times do you hear about the Dajjal? Rarely do we hear lectures on the Dajjal. Rarely is there a khutbah of Jum'ah on the Dajjal. And I go like to many cities and I give this lecture, and I ask the people, when's the last time? And most people say never. 
And some people say, yes, like a long time ago, I remember there was a lecture. Or maybe like last year sometime. It's very rare. And this in and of itself is a sign that the Dajjal is coming. Because when the Dajjal comes, he will not just come to meet you and greet you and be in your company and ask you your name and what you do for a living. He will come with trials and tribulations. He will come to test you, to take you away from Allah, to make you worship Him instead of Allah. But how can you succeed if you know about the Dajjal? If you know who the Dajjal is, you know his trials, you know how to overcome them, then he won't be successful. So the way he will be successful is that people won't know who the Dajjal is. They won't know what he will do. They won't know the trials that he will bring. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in yet another beautiful hadith, that whosoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf will be saved from the trials of the Dajjal. Now let us stop here and ponder. Because I just did a course in Ottawa for Maghrib Institute on Tafsir Surah Al-Kahf. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that whoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf will be saved from the trials of the Dajjal. And why is it in another hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recommended that we recite Surah Al-Kahf every single Friday? Not just once a year, not just once a month, not every so often, every single Friday of your life, you recite Surah Al-Kahf. Why? Now think about this Surah. When you think about Surah Al-Kahf, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions loads of stories within this. Yeah? He mentions the story of the people of the cave. He mentions the story of the man with the two gardens. He mentions the story of Musa and Khidr. He mentions the story of Dil Qarnayn. And he mentions one of the major signs of Yawm al Qiyamah. Which sign does he mention? This is a question for you. He mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj at the end of Surah Al Kahf. But when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith said that Surah Al Kahf will bring you protection, did he say he will bring you protection from Ma'juj and Ma'juj? No. Did he say he will bring you protection from Jahannam? No. Did he say he will bring you protection from the grave and his punishment? No. He said it will bring you protection from the Dajjal. Now how many times is the Dajjal mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf? How many times? How many times? Not a single time. Not once. Ya'juj and Ma'juj is mentioned twice. But the Dajjal is not mentioned a single time. So why then does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say reciting Surah Al-Kahf, memorizing the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf will bring you protection from the Dajjal and not from Ya'juj and Ma'juj and not from anything else. Why? This is the question that I want you to think about at the beginning and inshallah as we go along I will answer this as well. One of the first things that we need to do before we go into that link and what Surah Al-Kahf, why is it so special and why is it connected to the Dajjal? Have we ever stopped to think, by the way, why do we have to recite Surah Al-Kahf every single day, or every single Friday? Why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say Friday? Why not Monday? Why not Thursday? Why not Saturday or Sunday? Why every single Friday? And why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that whoever recites Surah Al-Kahf on a Friday, Allah Azza wa Jal will give him a light from that Friday until the next Friday. Why? And why the link between the two? Between the Dajjal and between Surah Al-Kahf? But first, before we go into all of that, we need to know who this Dajjal is. Where does he come from? Who is he? Where will he come from? And there are differences of opinions and some narrations regarding this. According to some scholars, he will be an ordinary man, and then on a single night he will transform into the Dajjal. He will be a normal man, and in a single night Allah Azza wa Jal will will and decree that a transformation will take place and he will become the Dajjal. And yet there are other narrations that mention that there were a number of companions after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who were traveling by the sea and they came across a cave. And within that cave, they met something that called itself the Dajjal. So there is 
varying narrations over this. But whether the Dajjal exists or doesn't exist, is it really such an important matter? Because what really matters, and subhanAllah, you know when, how shaitan comes and he misguides us. He makes us worry about this small issue. Is the Dajjal here? Is he not here? Where is he? Is he in America? Is he in England? Is he in Azerbaijan? Is he in Russia? Is he in China? And we worry about this. This is all we worry about. Yet we don't know what the Dajjal will do. We don't know what he looks like. We don't know how to overcome him. But we're worried about where he is, where he's hiding. As if we're going to go with an expedition and go and seek him out anyway. As if we're going to go and hunt for him. The Prophet wasallam will not focus on these small details. Because what's the major thing that we need to know? What the Dajjal will do and how we overcome his trials. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned for us, so that there's no doubt left in anyone's mind, what the Dajjal looks like, his appearance, where he will come from, the trials that he will bring, what will happen during his time, how long he will stay for upon the earth, where he will go and where he won't go, and how to overcome his trials, and finally how he will die. That's what you need to know. That's what you need to concentrate on. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he will come from a land known as Khurasan. And this land of Khurasan historically is a famous land. And it's a land where many scholars came from, such as the famous scholar of Hadith, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was from the land of Khurasan. It is said that the Dajjal will appear from this land. And this land is like around Iran and past, around that area. So he will come from this land, and as soon as he emerges, automatically, 70,000 people will follow him. Automatically. As soon as he appears, 70,000 people will immediately follow him, and they will become his army. And the Prophet ﷺ described him vividly. He didn't just say he is a beast or a big man or a strong man. He described him vividly. So that if me or you ever encounter him, we have no doubt left that this man or this thing is the Dajjal. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he will be blind in his right eye. He will be one-eyed. His, his right eye will be blind. And in the place of his eye will be something that looks like a protruded grape. A grape that sticks out. This is how his right eye will be. And as for his left eye, even that will not be clear. But rather he will have something that will look like a film over it. And some of the scholars mentioned and they described this and they said it's like the skin of a grape. So you know when you take a grape, you can peel the skin off. And if you were to look at the skin, it's transparent. You can kind of see through it, but it's not clear. So the Dajjal, on his right eye he will be blind. And his left eye will have something like this film or the skin over it. So even his left eye will not be clear. This is the first thing that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about him. Then he also mentioned the color of his skin, his complexion. And he said that it will be reddish white. This will be his complexion, reddish white. And then he mentioned that he will have a prominent forehead. So his forehead will be something which is prominent, it will stick out, you will notice it. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that his neck will be wide. And according to some scholars, it will be so wide, it will be as if his head directly fits onto his shoulders. And subhanAllah, I don't know if you've ever seen like bodybuilders, big bodybuilders like Mr. Universe or Mr. Canada or whatever you guys get here. But if you have these big bodybuilders, they lift so much weight. And all of these like things that they take, that you can't even see their neck anymore. It's as if their head fits directly on to their shoulders. This is how the Dajjal will be. And the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned that his back will be arched and curved. So he will be like a hunchback. His back will be arched and it will be curved. And the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned that his stance will be wide. He will stand wide apart. He will have a white stance. His feet will be white apart. And the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned his hair. And that it will be short and curly, like dreadlocks. And he said ﷺ describing his hair as if it is the heads of snakes. As if his hair will be the heads of snakes. 
And he also mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he will be sterile, infertile. He will be unable to have any children. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if this was not sufficient and not enough, he also mentioned that on his forehead he will have three letters written that each and every single Muslim will be able to read, whether they are literate or illiterate, educated or uneducated. And those three letters are kafara, disbeliever. So even the Muslims who cannot read and write, they're illiterate, they're uneducated. Allah Azza wa Jal will allow them to read those letters so they know that it is the Dajjal. SubhanAllah, sign after sign, description after description, so that you know exactly, vividly, what the Dajjal will look like, how he will appear, how he will come. And then the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned the time in which he will arrive and appear. And this is very important because we need to understand the context in which the Dajjal will emerge. Because sometimes, you know, when you say that the Dajjal will just come, people think, you know, it's going to be like a nice day and everyone's, everyone's going to be in the park playing or whatever you guys do, hockey here. And then all of a sudden the Dajjal will come. So how bad can it be? So we need to understand the context. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that three years before the Dajjal emerges, three years before the Dajjal comes, Allah Azza wa Jal will decree that a third of the rain that normally comes stops and a third of the vegetation and, earth and produce that comes from the earth will stop. So three years before, a third of the rain, a third of the produce will stop. Then two years before the Dajjal comes, two thirds of the rain will stop and two thirds of the vegetation and produce of the earth will stop. Two thirds. So the people are going from hunger to severe hunger. From hardship to hardship, from distress to distress, famine and drought. But it doesn't stop there. Because the Prophet ﷺ further mentioned that in the year before the Dajjal comes out, that, that last year before he comes out, one year before he arrives, Allah Azza wa Jal will decree that there will be no rain and there will be no vegetational produce. Nothing. Neither will the heaven give forth a single drop of rain nor will the earth produce a single grain. So the people will be in famine, drought. They will have no food. They will be in severe hardship. They will be poor. They will be rationing their food and storing it because there is no water and there is no food. And it is at this time that the Dajjal will appear. Subhanallah. How amazing, how severe that trial will be when the people don't have anything. They're as poor as anything can be. They have no food, no water, nothing to live on. Now the Dajjal will come with his trials. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Ankabut, Do the people think that simply because they say Amanna we believe, that they will be left alone, that they won't be tried, they won't be tested? وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ for of a surety, verily, indeed, we tried those who came before them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew those who would be truthful and those who would be liars. So do you think that just because we say amanna, we believe, we call ourselves Muslims, we say that we pray, that that's sufficient, nothing else will happen? Allah azza wa jal won't try us, won't test us? If those people who came before us, those nations that passed, those prophets and messengers that passed away, if they were all tested and tried, what makes you think you won't be tested and tried? And maybe your test, by which Allah Azza wa Jal will judge me and you, may be the trial of the Dajjal. So the Dajjal will come at a time of great famine. And he will come and he will order people to believe in him to disbelieve in Allah and to believe in Him as God and to worship Him. So He will come by and He will go across a group of people, a town, a village, a city, a group of people, and He will say to them, believe in me, for I am your God. And the people will refuse. They will say no. So He will continue on His way. He won't even bother killing them or fighting them 
or harming them in any way. He'll just walk on. But as soon as he walks away, everything that they possessed, all of the food that they rationed, everything that they stored will be instantaneously destroyed. Automatically it will be destroyed. He won't do anything to them physically. He won't harm them. But because they disbelieved in him, and as soon as they leave, he will make all of that vanish. All of it will be destroyed. And then he will come across another group of people, another town, another village, another city. And he will say to that group of people, believe in me for I am your Lord. And they will accept. They will say, yes, you are our Lord. And they will accept. And they will worship him. So he will point to the heavens and he will say, bring forth your rain. And the rain will descend upon them. And he will look at the earth and order it and command it, bring forth your produce and your vegetation. So the earth will bring forth its produce and its vegetation. So for those who reject him, everything that they were storing, even the small amount that they had, will be destroyed. And for those who accept him, he will order what seems to be like the heavens coming with rain. And the earth bringing forth its vegetation. And we know that all of this is by the will and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only this, but he will have with him a mountain of bread and meat that will follow him every single place he goes. So not only will he be able to give them rain and food, but when the people are so starving, the people are in such a dire need, he will have with him a mountain of bread and meat. So when people believe in him, he will say to them, go and take from the bread and meat. And when people are starving, when people are poor, when there is drought and famine, the most luxurious type of food is meat. So he will have the most luxurious type of food with him. And he will allow them to take from it as much as they want if they believe in him. And something else that he will do is that he will come across a group of people in a dry, barren land, infertile, nothing can grow there. It's pure desert. There's nothing there. It's barren, it's dead, it's dry. But he will say and point to the earth and he will say, Akhriji kunuzuki. Bring forth your treasures. So the earth will spit up everything within its belly. Gold, silver, Diamonds, rubies, gems, jewels, precious stones, all of them will come out from the earth upon his command by the will and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only this, but he will also have with him, following him, everywhere he goes, two rivers. A river that seems like cool water and a river that seems to be molten lava, burning fire. The lava that you get out of volcanoes. A river of water and a river of fire. But they will be deceptive appearances. Because the Prophet ﷺ informed us that indeed his water is in reality fire and his fire is in reality water. So if you're ever presented with the two, go for the fire, don't go for the water. Subhanallah. But how much iman will it take? If you were ever in that position, how much strength, courage, iman, taqwa, yaqeen would it take to say, no, I'm not going to jump in that cool water, I'm going to jump into the fire. It's not an easy thing. And this is why we're told to beware of the Dajjal, to seek refuge in him. Because not only will the times be hard, but his trial after trial after trial will be so severe that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that a man will go out to seek the Dajjal, to look at him out of curiosity, out of interest. He doesn't want to believe in him. He believes that he is a mu'min. But he goes out because he's curious. What is this Dajjal? What's this thing that everyone's talking about? What will he do? What's he doing? So out of curiosity, he will go to find out what the Dajjal is. And because of what he will see, he will disbelieve. Subhanallah. And the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned to us that a man will tie up his family, his wife, his daughters, the people in his household, he will tie them to his house to make sure they don't go out to seek the Dajjal. Just out of curiosity. No one will go out thinking that I'm going to believe in him. But they just want to see what's it all about. 
But because the trials he brings will be so severe, those people would disbelieve. And it doesn't stop there, but it continues. Because he will move from every single land to the next land, like wind-driven rain. The Prophet ﷺ described that he will go through the whole of the earth upon every single land, not leaving anything except for Mecca and Medina. And he will go and move like wind-driven rain. When you have rain and you have clouds, like today, and then you have that strong wind that pushes the clouds, those clouds will move from one country to another in a matter of seconds, in a matter of minutes. They will move so fast because of the, of the steady strong current of the wind. This is how the Dajjal will move upon the earth. He will move like wind-driven rain. And what makes this more amazing is that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us that the Dajjal will only remain upon the earth for how many days? 40 days. That's it. 40 days. And he will enter each and every single land except for Mecca and Medina. You know, around the world in 40 days, like we say, literally he will be around the world in 40 days, except for Mecca and Medina. And the Prophet wasallam mentioned that the first day of his 40 will equal the length of a year. And the second day of his 40 will equal the length of a month. And the third day of his 40 will equal the length of a week. And then all the remaining days will be normal. So the severe trial, it's not just a single day, but that first day will have the same length of a whole year. The second day, the whole length of a month. The third day, the whole length of a week. And then every other day will be normal. And if this wasn't enough, he will continue to bring trial after trial. And he will go to land upon land. And one of the trials that he will bring is that when people disbelieve in him, he will say to them, what if I resurrect your dead parents and they say to you, believe in me, will you believe? If I bring your dead parents back to life and I allow them to tell you that I am the true God, will you not believe? So they will say yes. So he will order two jinn to take the form of his dead parents, that person's dead parents. So they will come in the shape and the form of their dead mother and father. The mother and father are dead, in the ground, buried. But the jinn will take their form. And they will come to their child and they will say, Oh my child, believe in him, for he is your Lord. And that person will believe. Trial upon severe trial. And the Dajjal will go across each and every single land, not missing out anything. Until finally he comes to Medina. And he will come to Medina and at that time Medina will have gates surrounding it. And upon each gate there will be two angels with swords brandished, swords sticking out, so that the Dajjal will not be able to enter. But the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us that he will go and climb upon the mountain and he will look down and he will say, Hada Qasr Muhammad. This is the palace of Muhammad. Pointing to the, to the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. And in some narrations it is said he will say that this is the white palace of Muhammad. And if you were to look at the aerial photos of the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ, what color is it? It's white. So he will come and he will not be able to enter Medina. But those people within Medina who are not true believers, who are hypocrites or disbelievers, will be taken out. So the Dajjal will come to Medina and he will strike it with his fists three times. With each striking there will be an earthquake. And with each earthquake the hypocrites and disbelievers will be taken out of Medina. So for those people who are not truly believers, who think they can just run into Medina to seek refuge and protection from him, no. Because when he comes, his earthquakes will make them all come out. So no one will remain within Medina except the true believers. And then he will set up camp there. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there will be a young man who is living in Medina. And he will come out to seek the Dajjal. And there are many narrations concerning the story. But basically what happens is that this man will come out 
and he will come across a group of the army of the Dajjal and he will say to them take me to your Lord take me to your leader and so they will ask him do you believe in him and the man will reply no so they will say kill him here on the spot he's a disbeliever kill him but that one of them will say and he will remind the others do you not remember that the Dajjal said that any dispute that you have take it back to the Dajjal he is your judge so don't kill him because he will make him angry take him back to the Dajjal and let him deal with it so they will take him all the way back to the Dajjal and the Dajjal will ask him do you believe in me and he will reply no so the Dajjal to show the people around him his powers and the strengths that he has he will chop him in half from the middle of his head downwards chop him into two halves and he will even walk between the two halves to show that he is two separate parts and then he will walk back and then he will say to the man Qum, stand and the man will stand he will come back to one and then he will say to him again do you now believe and the man will reply no I have only increased in my insight of you now I definitely know that you are the Dajjal and you will not be able to do this to anyone after me so the Dajjal will lie, make him lie down and he will want to slaughter him to chop off his neck but Allah Azza wa Jal will decree that his neck will be protected by iron and copper so each time the Dajjal tries to strike off his neck the blade will bounce off he won't be able to go through it will be prevented and so frustrated the Dajjal will pick him up and throw him into the river of fire but the Prophet wasallam told us that in reality that river is not of fire but it is the cool river of, the, of water the cool river of paradise and the Prophet wasallam mentioned this man and he said this man, this youth he will be the greatest martyr in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this man who confronted the Dajjal he will be the greatest martyr in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> so the Dajjal will continue to move and there will be many other Muslims outside of Mecca and Medina and during that time the Mahdi will be present the Mahdi will be present and the Muslims will be encamped in Jerusalem they will be encamped in the fortress that is Jerusalem and the Dajjal will come to fight them this is the last stand for the Muslims this is the last place that they will make their stand this is the major final battle between the Dajjal and the Muslims so the Dajjal will be laying siege to the fortress him and his army will lay siege to the fortress until one day that the Mahdi will come out and he will want to lead the Fajr prayer in the morning and by that time Isa alayhi salatu wassalam will have descended in Damascus and he will make his way to Jerusalem and he will arrive at that Fajr time so when they see Isa alayhi salam the Mahdi will step back and he will say to Isa lead the prayer Jesus but Isa alayhi salam will say no this is your ummah and you are its leader and he will step back so the Mahdi will go and he will lead the Fajr prayer and after they finish the Fajr prayer the walls of Damascus, the walls of Jerusalem the fortress will be breached and the Dajjal and its army will enter into Jerusalem and the fighting will begin and as they are fighting the Dajjal will see Isa alayhi salatu wassalam and as soon as he sees him he begins to dissolve and disintegrate simply by seeing him all of his strengths all of his powers that he had he will begin to dissolve and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam described this and he said it is just as salt dissolves in water what happens when you put salt in water it vanishes you can't see it it just dissolves immediately he will begin to dissolve like this simply seeing Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and so he will dissolve and because his powers are diminishing his strengths are going he will notice and he will run and flee he will run away and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will chase him and he will chase him and finally he will catch him and he will kill him and he will take off his head and then he will show it to the people so that the people will know that the Dajjal is dead 
and then the Muslims will be victorious in their battle. So this is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned to us. From the stories of the Dajjal, from his appearance, from the trials that he will bring, and how he will eventually be killed and destroyed. Now here, there's a few important points that I want to mention to you. How do we seek protection from the Dajjal? There are many ways and many things that we can do. The first and foremost thing that we need to do is we need to learn about our religion. And we need to learn about all of the different aspects of our religion, including the Dajjal. Now remember that story that I mentioned to you at the beginning of that man in the Haram who stabbed someone that he thought was a Dajjal. Had he studied Islam, had he studied the Dajjal, he would have known that it can't be the Dajjal. The Dajjal cannot enter Mecca and Medina. Let alone be performing in ihram, performing tawaf in that time. He would also know that even if he was the Dajjal, he would not be able to kill him because only Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will kill him. Had he studied the Dajjal, he would have known all of this and he would have known that this man cannot be the Dajjal. But because he didn't study his religion, he didn't know about the Dajjal, he didn't know what he looked like, he didn't know the trials that he will bring, he didn't know his story. He was deceived and he did what he did. The second thing that we need to do is to hold on firmly to Islam. So it's not just simply learning about the religion, but rather implementing it and applying it. And I'll give you an example of this. When the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in that hadith that the Dajjal will stay upon the earth for 40 days. The first day will be like a year, the second day like a month, the third day like a week, and then the rest of the days will be normal days. What question did the companions radiallahu anhum ask? What was their first thought? What was the question that they asked? They asked about salah, the prayer. Now imagine if we had been there. Our question would have been, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how do we defend ourselves? O oh, Messenger of Allah, what weapon shall we build? O oh, Messenger of Allah, is there some martial arts that I can learn to take on the Dajjal? O oh, Messenger of Allah, what shall I do? Where shall I run? How shall I do it? The companions were educated and nurtured in a different way. Their way of thinking was different. They knew the story of the Dajjal. Their main concern wasn't what was going to happen with the Dajjal, where he's going to go, how he's going to be defeated. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how will we pray on that day? That day, that will be like a year. Its length will be like a year. How shall we pray? SubhanAllah, look at this beauty and education that the Prophet ﷺ gave his companions radiallahu anhum. This is what we need to do for ourselves, our families, our children. So that when they, are, they, are, um, they come across these trials and tribulations, they face them not thinking about other stuff which is in, in unimportant. But rather they think about the salah, about the iman, about taqwa. O oh, Messenger of Allah, how shall we pray on that day? So the Prophet ﷺ said to them, estimate. Estimate. The day will be like a year. So estimate the times of the prayer. You still have to pray the prayers of the year, but you need to estimate the timings. So the Prophet ﷺ is educating them about the prayer. So number two, holding firmly onto Islam. It's not just simply saying I'm a Muslim, learning about stuff and not doing anything about it. It needs to be practically implemented. Number three, to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To learn about our aqeedah, our belief, our creed. To learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his names and his attributes. Because if we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will not be fooled by anyone else that claims to be God. But if we don't know Allah, then someone that comes to claim and claims to be God and he has all of these powers, we will be fooled by him and deceived. We will be fooled and deceived by him. But if we know Allah Azza wa Jal, we know that he is not one eyed. We know, for example, that he will not have the word disbeliever written on his forehead. We know that Allah Azza wa Jal will not be hunchbacked, that he is perfect, that he is all knowing, that he is all hearing, that he is all seeing then how can we be deceived by anything else, by this Dajjal, or anyone else that claims to be God? But if a person doesn't know their own Lord, who they're worshipping, they don't know his names and his attributes, they can easily be deceived. Number four, the fourth thing that we need to do, 
is we need to remember those du'as that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught to his companions just as he taught them a surah of the Qur'an. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min athabi jahannam wa min athabi al-qabr wa min fitnat al-mahya wal mamat wa min fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. It's a very simple du'a, four statements. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would teach it like he would teach surah al-Fatiha in each and every single prayer. Now for the majority of us, our families, our children, they may not know this dua, and we don't teach them this dua. So how then will they be protected from the trials of the Dajjal when they don't return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua to him? And the fifth and final thing that I want to mention to you with regards and in terms of seeking protection from the Dajjal is memorizing those first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Now when you come to Surah Al-Kahf, and this is like what I was mentioning at the beginning. When you come to Surah Al-Kahf and you mention and you memorize those first 10 verses and you recite Surah Al-Kahf every single Friday, why is it that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making this link between Surah Al-Kahf and the trials of the Dajjal? And the answer is very simple. Surah Al-Kahf, from the beginning to the end, its major theme is the trials and tribulations that a person will face in this life. The trials and tribulations that a person will face in this life. And there are six of these trials. You may face one of them, all of them, or any combination of them. But Allah Azza wa Jal within the surah mentions these trials so that you will be prepared and you will know how to overcome them. And why the Dajjal is linked to this surah, the reason is because the Dajjal when he comes will bring these same six trials. And these are the trials that he will also use. So these are general trials that a person may face during their life. But when the Dajjal comes, he will also have these six trials. So when a person knows from Surah Al-Kahf what these trials are and how to overcome them, then when the Dajjal comes with the same six trials, he will also know how to overcome them. These six trials very quickly, and this in and of itself is a different lecture. The six trials mentioned within Surah Al-Kahf. But very quickly, the first trial is the trial of oppression and injustice. Oppression and injustice. The second trial is the trial of the love of the rich and powerful. The third trial is the trial of wealth and children. The fourth trial is the trial of the arrogance of one's lineage, his ancestry, being arrogant about his roots. Number five, the trial of knowledge. And number six, the trial of leadership. These are the six trials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Kahf throughout the various stories in Surah Al-Kahf. Now let us take these six trials once again and let us connect it to the Dajjal. Now that you know the story of the Dajjal, let us connect it to the Dajjal. So the first trial will be the trial of oppression and injustice. And oppression and injustice of the Dajjal will be immediate. As soon as he comes, when he goes across people, he will kill them. He will chop them into half. He will throw them into the fire. He will destroy all of their possessions. Trial of oppression and injustice over and over again. So he will continue to beat them and he will continue to destroy them and he will continue to kill them until the people disbelieve in Allah and they believe in him. The trial of oppression and injustice. And this is something mentioned over and over again. In the story of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions it in the story of the people of the cave. They feared that their king and their people would oppress them and do injustice towards them. So they went into the cave and they sought refuge there. This is the same trial that the Dajjal will bring also. His second trial will be the trial of the love of the rich and powerful. Now the love of the rich and powerful doesn't mean that you yourself or that person has money or wealth. What it means is that they love to be associated with those who are rich and powerful. So for example, when you see someone who's very rich or from a royal family or from someone that's very powerful, even their lowliest assistants, the people who are the lowliest people in their organizations, the people who are right at the bottom, 
because they are associated with this power and this riches and this fame, they also think that they are better than everyone else. Even though their job may be the lowliest job, but simply because of association, the love of the rich and powerful, they think they are better. So likewise with the Dajjal, as soon as he comes out, 70,000 people immediately will follow him. Why? They won't be given any wealth. They won't be given any power. Nothing will be offered to them. But immediately they will accept. Because they will see the power of the Dajjal, the wealth that the Dajjal possesses. Everything that he has, and automatically they want to be associated with him. So they will have this rich, uh, love for the rich and powerful. So this is the second trial that he will bring. The third trial is the trial of wealth and children. And children can also mean manpower. So the Dajjal will have wealth. He will have this mountain of bread and meat. He will allow the heavens to bring forth. He will order the earth to bring forth its vegetation. He will make different types of treasures come from the earth. And for those who believe in him, they can have access to all of this. They can have access to all of this wealth. And to all of his manpower that he has, the thousands upon thousands of people that will follow him. So he will bring this, this trial of wealth and children. The fourth trial that he will bring is the trial of arrogance of lineage, a person's ancestry. He will use a person's roots, his ancestors, his lineage, his forefathers in order to misguide them. And the example of this is the one that I gave during the lecture, when he will make the jinn take the shape and the form of a person's dead parents. Those people refused to believe in the Dajjal. So what changed their minds? It was their ancestry, their forefathers, their lineage. Because they're proud of their forefathers. So when the jinn take the shape of their parents, and the parents say to the children, believe in the Dajjal, he is your Lord, they will believe. Arrogance of lineage. They will believe in their forefathers, and they will follow their forefathers to misguidance. Number five, knowledge. He will be given knowledge and he will use this knowledge to go across the whole of the earth. So he will be like wind driven rain and he will enter into every single land except Mecca and Medina and he will conquer the people in every single land. He will be given much knowledge and based upon the knowledge that he has, he will misguide the people and the people will disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sixth and final trial, the trial of leadership. The trial of leadership. So he will have possession of the earth, rulership and authority over the whole of the earth. Except for Mecca and Medina, he will have conquered and entered every single land. So he will have all of this leadership. And so he will use this also to make people disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when a person recites Surah Al-Kahf and he reads Surah Al-Kahf, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions one of these different trials, he also mentions the outcome and how to overcome these trials. But this is a different lecture in and of itself and it would take too much time to go into. But I, what I request from you in conclusion is don't just think that the Dajjal is something that you don't need to be worried about. Study the Dajjal as well as the other major signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Learn about them, teach them to your families and to your children. Because even if you know about them now, the likelihood is that the next generation, your children, your younger brothers and sisters, your nephews and nieces will not know about the Dajjal. And so when they're asked about the Dajjal, they will say, yes, we heard about it. Someone mentioned to it. Our elders, our forefathers, our, you know, the people in our communities to always talk about the Dajjal, but we don't know what this Dajjal is. And this in and of itself is a sign that the Dajjal is coming. So teach it to your children, to your family members. And then recite Surah Al-Kahf, but don't just recite it. And don't just look over the meanings and the translation of Surah Al-Kahf, but go deeply into its tafsir. Because Allah Azza wa Jal chose this Surah for us to recite every single week. And it's not just that you have to worry about the Dajjal when he comes and the trials that he brings, but these six trials, oppression and injustice, love of the rich and powerful, wealth and children, arrogance of lineage, knowledge and leadership, these are trials that people face throughout their lives. Whether the Dajjal comes or, not, or doesn't come, they will face this over and over again. So we need to know how to overcome these trials. 
And the answer lies within Surah Al-Kahf. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from His immense mercy hasn't just given us the trials and the problems, He's also given us the solution to the problem. So inshallah I hope that each and every single one of you will go back and recite Surah Al-Kahf and understand Surah Al-Kahf and study it deeply and then implement it and apply it practically. هذا والله تعالى علم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. Do we have any questions? Okay, so I think we have like some time for questions. So we have seven minutes exactly.